Good morning. Uh, this is our last morning together, our last session together, right? So I started with a simple message. It got a little bit more complex. Last night was more involved, and today's the most difficult lesson. So you have to put your thinking cap on because this lesson is something that God is showing me according to the time we are living in now. Let me begin by asking a question. Has everything changed in the last five years? Yes or no? Well, that's a very open question. Has many, have many things changed in the last five years? That's a better question. Thank you. In fact, it seems like for the last 20, 30, 40 years prior, things were going at a certain rhythm, whether good or bad, but they were pretty stable. Economy, health, government, pretty much stable. And in the last four or five years, everything's been turned upside down. Do you understand why? I hope by the end of this lesson you will. I want to make clear that I'm not taking a political position. I'm not supporting one candidate. I'm not uh, criticizing another candidate or our president. I have my personal understanding. I don't agree what's happening. But I'm trying to explain where all of this is coming from. What is God allowing to happen? And the key is in the Messianic Psalm, Psalm 2. Five, ten years ago, I would read Psalm 2. And for me, Psalm 2 was the coronation day of Jesus Christ. When Jesus comes back to rule a thousand years and then forever in heaven. But now I see Psalm 2 as an explanation of what's happening right today, right now, this year, this moment, this month. Let's read Psalm 2. But before we do, could stand with me. I want to pray one prayer. That stand. Пожалуйста, вставайте. Засидите. Let us pray that God would open our eyes, not only our physical eyes, but eyes of our heart, eyes of our understanding. I don't want a political view. I want a godly view, a heavenly view of what's happening right now. Our Father who art in heaven, we pray that you, by the Holy Spirit, would open our hearts, would open our minds, would open our ears, would open our understanding, Lord. We don't want to mislead the people. We don't want to put the emphasis on the wrong words or sentences. But give us clear understanding, Lord, what you are saying to the church. What your word has said to the church. Prepare us for the last days. Prepare us to be lights that shine in darkness, Lord, as the days grow darker. But your presence is yet going to be brighter. For the glory of God, in Jesus' name, amen. 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 Psalm 2. It begins like this. Why do the nations rage or become very, very angry? And the peoples plot. That is that they gather together and they make a plan. Let's take verse 1 and analyze this. We know that the world is a system against God. And there is a ruler of this world called Satan, yes? Ephesians chapter 2 calls him the God, small g, small g, of this world. When Jesus Christ died on the cross, he, he went into hell itself and he took the keys of death and hell. And from that time of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, 
Now the believer who dies in Jesus Christ, he is taken into the presence of God as soon as he dies. But the world has not yet been redeemed by government to be the government of Jesus Christ, our Lord. That day will come, yes? That day will come where Jesus will return with his angels and those who have died with the Lord and those who are transformed and his foot will step on the Mount of Olives and his reign shall be forever and ever and ever. Hallelujah. Until that day, his coronation where he's made king physically of the earth and of heaven, up until that time, this world is in darkness. And Satan is giving power to the kings, leaders, prime ministers, presidents, rulers of political governments all over the world, of China, of Russia, of America, and all the rest of the countries. Now it says that as the coming of the Lord gets closer and closer and closer, Psalm 2 will become to be fulfilled. But watch what's happening. There is an anger now that wasn't five, ten years ago. Do you see people in government angry? Everybody is angry at everybody. <laughs> Before, you could say one thing, okay? You could say another thing, and you would have normal debates about politics, about religion, about different opinions. Today, you can't say anything. <laughs> they cancel you. <laughs> There's so much anger. Secondly, the people get together to make a plan. Have you ever thought what's happening in this G20, G8? G stands for government. They meet someplace in Davos, Switzerland. Who are these people? <laughs> what do they meet about? What do they talk about? What do they decide about the world governments today? I'll tell you. Generally speaking, I know. Specifically, I don't know. Here's what I think they're talking about. How to make a global government. It's called globalism. Countries will not matter anymore. All the countries of the world will be un under one political ruler guess who that's going to be? The Antichrist. And do you know that the kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel. That means they talk to each other against the Lord and against his anointed. Who is the anointed of the Lord? Jesus Christ. Yes? And what are they saying? What is what is? What is the political movement that actually has an a anti-Christian thrust? What are they saying? Let's burst their bonds and cast away their cords from us. Let me explain. They are saying that the word of God, they are saying that the Ten Commandments, they are saying that the word of God that preaches against sin is like cords that tie people up. They're saying, why do we have these moral laws of the Ten Commandments? Let's do away with the Bible, the word of God, the T Ten Commandments, the principles of God. Let's break these cords that tie us up. And today, they're trying to destroy our traditions that are Christian, destroy our Christian values, and they're going to substitute them with anti-Christian values. Now, before we get to the Antichrist, he is one man that Satan will give his power, and he's the one against Christ, and he will become a ru world ruler for a short time. But before we even talk about him, John tells us there are many, 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 many antichrists. There is a spirit of antichrist. Who is holding this all back? The Holy Spirit. But Paul tells us in Thessalonians, I just read it last night when I was going to bed. 
that he who restrains, he who holds back, will slowly be taken out of the way. And God is allowing evil rulers, evil spirits, evil politicians to demonstrate their wickedness, throw off the laws of God, change the governments, and they are working in the spirit of preparation for the Antichrist. Let's go to the next slide. Wait a minute, did we go before that? You clicked too fast. Hold on, go back, go back. I believe that that's one, yes. So moral restraints are being cast off. Rulers are planning together to change the laws and the government. This is working against the Lord, against God's people, and this is called the spirit of Antichrist. We'll get to the man who will be the Antichrist. I don't know who he is, but before he's revealed, there are preparations for him. Let's go to the next slide. God's laws are now being rejected by society, even here in America. This never happened before. There were Christians, there were non-Christians. The non-Christians just didn't believe in the word of God and didn't believe in Christians. But never before are they attacked. Did you think that 4% of the homosexual community, LGBT, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, all the letters, are going to sue where 4% of America's population has now more than the majority of the people voting and accepting their lifestyle. We're not hating people. We're not afraid homophobia. I'm not afraid. But we're standing up for the word of God and we're being attacked, we're being sued, we're being fined, we're being put in jail for speaking the word of God. This is happening in our day, which wouldn't happen 5, 10, 15 years ago. Truth itself is being attacked because there's a plan to destroy the foundation. The Bible says, if you destroy the foundation, the whole building collapses. Tell me, church, what is the foundation of the church? It's Jesus Christ, yes? And his holy word. If you destroy the word of God or the value of the word of God, you are trying to destroy the entire foundation. Now go to the next slide and it talks about understanding the times in which we live. Do you know there were 12 tribes, but God said about one of the 12 tribes, the tribe of Issachar, they were wiser than their brothers. Why did God call them wiser? Because they had understanding of the times to know what Israel should do. This morning... I'm not taking a political view. I'm not convincing you of a party or of a president or of a government. I want you to understand what is happening and why it is happening and what you need to do or what has to happen. Next slide. We live in a time of great division. Do you know that Jesus told a story, it's not in my overhead, but he told a story that a man planted beautiful wheat in his field. And he used good seed and the wheat is starting to come up. But someone came in the night and he planted weeds, tares, pukrinsky kukil, right? Bad, bad seed. And then they started to grow together with the wheat. And so the farmer's assistants or helpers came. They said, Master, should we pull out the bad seed, the bad weeds? He said, no, you'll harm the wheat. Let them grow together. At the end times, I will separate them. The wheat will go into good storage and the weeds, the bad foliage the bad seed shall be burned 
Do you know we're living in that time of division? Politically, we have the left. Before we had Republicans and Democrats, and they were not that far apart. They were different, but, you know, we had Democratic presidents, which basically didn't ruin our, our culture. But now you have the far left, which are bringing socialism. Who would think that in America, young people are asking for socialism? Are you out of your mind? You all came from the Soviet Union. You know what socialism would do, right? It's a corrupt system. It doesn't work. Nobody shares. People use socialism for themselves and power for those who have the power. Politically, we're so divided. And society now has chaos. Did you think five, ten years ago that cities would burn and nobody would be arrested? Did you think that? They're breaking the law and nobody's being punished. They're burning businesses, burning federal buildings, and nobody's put into jail. Or if they are, they're being released right away. And you have people dressed in black called Antifa, anti-fascist. But they're the biggest fascist that you ever will see. <laughs> because they take uh, key, they take uh, key, they take sticks, and they breaking the store windows. Why? Because they have a demonic doctrine called revolution. Did you know that Karl Marx, he said that for a new system to come, we must destroy, we must burn down the old system. And so they're thinking, I um, really apologize, please. Дорогие наши мамы, папы, мы очень вас любим и любим ваших детей. Пожалуйста, если вы не можете навести порядок с вашим ребенком, сделайте так, чтобы он здесь не мешал. Вы не представляете, как трудно говорить человеку, который сейчас слышит, ну там, 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 шум этот. Дети, мы вас очень любим, и слава Богу за то, что вы у нас есть. I'm so sorry, я прошу прощения. Но, пожалуйста, ну вы можете потерпеть, положите ваши эти все рисунки в сторону и послушайте, что вам говорит сейчас Бог через этого хорошего дядю. Если, мамы, вы не можете справиться с вашими людьми, детьми, дайте, пожалуйста, скрыть, я пойду там с ней буду заниматься. Я, на, я вам сумею их разглядеть. Но чтобы сделайте, пожалуйста, чтобы человек нормально мог нам служить, а мы нормально, спокойно могли возлежать и принимать то, что Бог хочет нам сказать. Аминь. Я прошу прощения. Мне не трудно говорить, но вам, возможно, трудно слушать. No law and then cold love. Lawlessness, the love will grow cold. Now I understand. Because a person who has a law in their heart, a person who obeys government, who obeys the law, who, who obeys traffic, who obeys red lights, who obeys pariadok, order. When you see chaos, when you see lawlessness, you go, why isn't anybody doing anything? Because Karl Marx said, to put a new system, we have to burn down the old system. We have to destroy the old system. And then look how foolish his theory is. And from the ashes, Popin, from the burnt down embers shall rise a society, a utopia. Where man shall build a paradise. Дорогой, где и когда? Where and when? Oh, they didn't do it right. Okay, Soviet Union did do right. How about China? They didn't do it right. How about Venezuela? They didn't do it right. Cuba? No, the embargo. Who's going to do it right? We're going to do it right. 
Yeah, yeah, keep believing. <laughs> and the love of good people for the law, for society, not even people who are saved, who are decent, law-abiding, they throw their hands up in the air and they don't watch the news anymore. My wife and I, we stopped watching the news. I, I was screaming at the television. <laughs> it doesn't help. They're not listening. <laughs> and spiritually, you have the atheists and you have the believers in God. But the Bible says, the holy shall become more holy, yes? And the evil shall become more evil. So I'm bringing this message not to complain but to say, open your eyes. Jesus is coming. These are the last days. The Bible said these things will happen. And then when they happen, we say, oh, why is this happening? Why do the heathen rage? Why do they want to change our laws? Keep listening. <laughs> Keep listening. Agenda of the kingdom of darkness. Next slide. You see, the ruler of this world doesn't ask permission. He will put his laws by force, working from the outside. Jesus did the opposite. He said, repent, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And he changed people from the outside? No, no, no. He changed their hearts. Yes? He asked them to follow him. So true change, true transformation individuals and society it starts inside with our hearts our choices but no no the ruler of this world you know не хочешь не знаешь научим не хочешь hello <laughs> you don't know we'll teach you you don't want to we'll force you and now we are being forced with laws that will punish us if we don't obey their new direction now, here are four things that are happening right now. And they are Marxist. They are, they are uh, humanist. Number one, destroy the opposition. That's what Lenin did when a small group of communists took over czarist Russia. Russia is a big country, a big empire. Had kings, had royalty. Yes, there were injustices. Yes, there was corruption. Yes, all of that. Yes, people welcomed Lenin. Yes, because they didn't know what they were welcoming. America doesn't know what they're welcoming. But what did Lenin do? What do these people want to do? Destroy anyone who's... A, there's no dialogue. There's no debate. Cancel culture. Destroy. Put them in jail. Secondly, fear is a tactic of control. Do you know that there were two people who wanted to defend their house as Black Lives Matter broke their gate and went on private property. They showed a knife to these people. We'll cut you to pieces. And so he went, he got a gun. Then the district attorney wants to put these two people in jail, not the people who trespassed their property. So now the governor pardoned this couple. He said, you have no guilt. You could still, it was a lawyer. You could practice law, and the representative of St. Louis said, your day will come. In other words, we'll find people that will come to your house and burn your house down to make them afraid. And that's the tactic of Satan. Number three, let's rip out the pages of American history and let's rewrite it. You're racist. Because you're white, because of this, because of that. And they're using this propaganda from universities down to high schools, down to elementary schools, to first grade. Man, I'm like shocked. Christopher Columbus was a bad dude. I'm reading a book called The Light and the Glory that talk about how the Holy Spirit spoke to him to go past the fear of falling off the edge of the earth. And the Holy Spirit guided him to the new country. And the first believers who came made a covenant with God. That's our history in this country. 
And God blessed America because America would become a mission sending agency. 80% of all the money for Christian work comes out of America. 80% in all the world. So God has blessed us so would we would be a blessing. But no, no, our history is racist. Our history is bad. And number four, propaganda. Propaganda is saying if you repeat a lie enough times, it will become truth. Tell people they're racist. Tell people they're this. Tell people they're that. Oh, I'm ashamed to be white. Who made black and who made white and who made yellow and who made red? Who made all of us? God. And one is not better than the other and the other shouldn't be racist against the first. We are all God's children, red and yellow, black and white. They are precious in his sight. Jesus loves the little children of the world. Yes? Next slide. Now, the power of the kingdom of God goes from the heart. And this is what you and I have to be careful to do. Number one, first, don't hate people. Overcome evil, says the Bible, with good. That is the most difficult thing for me to do, not to respond to the haters of the gospel with hatred towards them. God's word says to hate sin, but not to hate the sinner. Did Jesus hate the centurion who was pounding the nails into his hands? On the, did he hate him? How do you know? How do you know he didn't hate him? He, he prayed for them. <laughs> Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. They're crucifying the Son of God who made the earth, who created the stars, the sun, the moon, the mountains, the rivers, the oceans. By his word, he created. John 1 says, all things were created through Jesus, the word of God. And God is being crucified. And foolish men are putting nails and spikes into his hands and his feet. Did they understand? No. Did they know? No. Even the demons in hell that night, Jesus died. They probably had a celebration. We killed the Son of God. Can you imagine how powerful we are? Until Sunday morning. <laughs> where the stone is rolled away. Where Jesus Christ is risen in glory. Hallelujah. Overcome evil with good. The most powerful words you can say to someone who hurts you is, I forgive you. I love you in Jesus. Secondly, use love in response to hate. Thirdly, there is a good history. Learn it and honor it. Do you know that people died to make us a free country? People paid with their blood to give us a constitution that allows us to worship God freely. It allows us to assemble. And the government says you have no right to assemble. They closed the churches. They closed the schools. Oh, the COVID. Understand, for a short time, till we figure it out, okay. But now they're using it as a political weapon. And it's so sad. But the most important of all these four is not only to love, but to speak truth. Because truth will, is eternal. Apostle Paul in Corinthians says, we cannot do anything against the truth, only for the truth. The truth is so powerful that 2,000 years ago, Jesus rose from the dead. People tried to lie and said, no, he didn't rise from the dead. But the truth is still the truth. Next slide. Now, let's look at the foundation of truth. The way that we think has two ways. Our personal experience or 
truth without our personal experience. Our personal experience is called subjective. I am the subject, so I believe it's this way. That's in the subjective truth. But truth is not according to George, according to you, according to Marxists, according to political people. Truth is truth no matter who says it, if it's true, yes or no. Truth exists without us. Let's say it's like gravity. Let's say I climb on top of this building and I am a gravity atheist. I don't believe in gravity. And I say to everybody, I have a new political party, the anti-gravity party. And I'm going to demonstrate to you how my truth is so powerful. And I jump off the building onto concrete, cement. Does gravity listen to my truth? No. Plaska. <laughs> Derun. <laughs> I smashed my face on the cement because truth exists without me. It's not what I say. It's not what I want. It's not what I believe. It's not what I force people to believe by law. Truth will stand as truth forever and eternal. And the word of God is truth. Amen. So go to the next slide, which says truth is absolute. Do you know that science is based on facts? Science is based on what is reality, what we see, what we can prove again and again and again. Now, I'm going to give you such a simple example. You may think this is too silly. But two fingers plus two more fingers, okay, mathematical geniuses, how many fingers do we have? Well, I thank you. That's brilliant. <laughs> Four fingers. But what if I reject four for my reasons, selfish reasons, foolish reasons, reasons of lying, reasons of manipulating truth? What if I discard, throw away four? Next slide. Will I ever reach the true answer? If I put three, if I put five, if I put ten, if I put minus six, I can go through infinity in positive numbers, infinity in negative numbers, every kind of equation you can invent. I will never reach the truth because I've rejected the only answer. And what's the only answer? It's four. And when people reject truth, they have to make a lie. And they have to make people believe a lie. And so they take objective truth, which is true anyway, and they substitute it with subjective truth. Well, it could be four for you, but for me it's five. Listen, Oprah, Oprah on her program, she says all the time, and I don't watch it, but I heard her say it one time, and then she, I heard her do it a second time in an interview, she said, you have your truth and I have my truth. Wait a minute. <laughs> There's no such thing as you have a personal truth. Now, you have a personal experience. Okay, I get it. You experienced A or you experienced B or you went through this thing and that's an experience, but that's not entire truth. That's what you went through. That's your history. But truth is objective. It's absolute. And so um, a friend of mine who uh, ministers in universities, he was talking to students, and he's talking about how truth is absolute. And one student got up and he says, there is no absolute truth. And my friend said to him, are you absolutely sure? Yes. Uh, wait, no. <laughs> to say something that doesn't exist is an absolute statement. And so they, they, they're searching. Timothy, uh, Paul writes to Timothy, always learning. These educated people are always learning. 
and they're never able to arrive at the truth. Why? They start from the wrong foundation. There is no God. They start from the wrong basis, the supposition that there's no absolute truth. Now, the next slide, Bible, okay, go to the next one. The Bible doesn't contradict science. Listen to these famous scientists in past. Copernicus, Galileo, Newton, who discovered gravity, Kepler, who was an astronomer, astronomer Albert Einstein, who was Jewish. They were believers in the creator of the universe. And they were brilliant men of science. Nobody contradicted them. But they ended up contradicting the Bible, the word of God. Now let's take three words. Yesterday, today, and tomorrow. What is going to happen? What happened yesterday? What is happening today? And I want to finish with what will happen tomorrow. Number one, yesterday. What was? Do you know, not so long ago, we had more moral, morality principles. We had right and we had wrong. In fact, when I was a little boy, right, in Catholic schools, which were very strict, the nuns had a ruler and she could, they could hit your hand if you were bad in class. Today, they can't do that. You would be sued. Oh, you're abusing the children, <laughs> right? Yesterday, if, you'd, if you got called to the principal's office, you would be punished in school. And then when you get home, you'd be punished at home too. <laughs> and now they want to punish the teacher. How dare you come against my child? My child would never do things like that. Your child is a rebel. <laughs> Yesterday, next slide, we had strong families, two parents. Did you know that divorce was a shame? When I was a little boy in New Jersey, anybody who said their mom and dad were divorced, we'd look at him like, oh, that's too bad. It was rare. It was unusual. It was embarrassing. Today, 78% of African American girls have children and not married. More than half of all marriages, almost two-thirds in, Amer in America, ending up in divorce. Yesterday, we had more discipline. Yesterday, we had deeper faith. Even people who are not believers, they were more afraid of breaking the law. But then we have what's called nostalgia. Go to the next one. Yearning for the past. Oh, man. Oh, man. Then we prayed. It was revival. But Solomon says every generation says that. Why? Because our memories make sweet what we remember. We forget the bad and we really remember the good. So Solomon, the wisest man, say, don't say that those days were better than these. That's not wisdom. They were different. They were different. By the way, when you talk about grapes, you're talking about seasons. Let me ask you this. Is every season the same? How about weather? Is every year in uh, Alaska the same weather every, exactly? You have warmer summers and you have colder summers, yes? You have colder winters and not so cold, right? So every year is different. Every season is different. So we recognize the differences. Now let's go about yesterday. Jesus had three friends, Lazarus and his two sisters, Mary and Martha. When Jesus... Bethany, their house, was two miles from Jerusalem. You could walk there in, 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 in one hour. And so that was one of the few places Jesus could sleep at night in their home. And they received him with a dinner. And they were so kind to him. And then one day Lazarus gets very, very sick. Jesus is away in Jerusalem. 
or Galilee, I can't remember. And his disciples give him the news that his friend Lazarus is dying. And Jesus deliberately waits. Then Lazarus dies. Jesus doesn't go to the funeral. One day, two, three. On the fourth day, Jesus said, let's go visit Lazarus. And you know the story. So Martha runs out to meet Jesus. And she said, Lord, if you had been here. She was talking about yesterday, yes? And so Jesus says to Martha, Martha, Lazarus will live. She thinks about tomorrow. Yes, Lord, that's true. In the resurrection where everybody's raised, he will one day live. You see, Martha believed in yesterday and Martha believed in tomorrow. But Jesus is there today. And he said, I am the resurrection. And today, show me where you raised him. He said, Lazarus, come forth. <laughs> and here comes Lazarus. Do you know why Jesus waited four days? Not only to prove that he could raise a dead person, but the bandages that they wrapped him with had dried. Do you know when they buried the dead, they would take linen strips and tear them, yes? And then they would dip them in aromatic oils and balsam. And they would be wet and they would wrap the head, they would wrap the arms, they would wrap the body, they would wrap the legs, and they made them into mummies. And so these wet bandages would soak into the dead corpse, and they, in their thinking, would preserve the body a little bit longer. I don't know why they would want to do that, but they did, right? So now on the fourth day, the bandages have dried completely into a crust, into a, you ever see a plaster cast? Of course, somebody breaks an arm. Maybe not as thick, maybe not as strong. And so when Jesus said, Lazarus, come forth, he came out with difficulty <laughs> because the bandages were dried as proof that you can't put dried bandages on a body right away. And it would take four days to, to, to dry. And so the bandages were proof that Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. Somebody say amen. <laughs> Thank you, young man. Thank you. Yesterday, what was? You can't drive a car by looking into the rearview mirror. So now, let's talk about today. Today, next slide, what is? Today we live in what's called a postmodern society. We already said it rejects objective truth or reality. It rejects moral absolutes. What is a moral absolute? That sin is always sin. Sin was sin 2,000 years ago when Jesus forgave people. And the same sins, adultery, fornication, murder, stealing, lying, the Ten Commandments, they are eternal. Yes? But now, today, we have moral relativity. Is it wrong to lie? It depends. Is it wrong to steal? Well, people were hungry. I saw the news reporters are reporting on the looting of Louis Vuitton stores. You know those bags like $3,000, $5,000? They're vinyl, ladies. They're vinyl. And the people are breaking the windows, stealing bags. And the newscaster said, well, maybe it's because they needed them. <laughs> Expensive purses? <laughs> no. No. <laughs> Food, maybe, but not bags. Today, next slide, society asks, what is truth? And the devil sows doubts. Did God really say? Next slide, I'm going to go fast here. But God's word is truth. John 17 said, your word is truth. Do you know that truth makes you holy? What is holiness? Absolute dedication to truth. 
characteristics of truth. Next slide. You could know truth. It's self-evident, not hidden. The Bible says, send your light, send your truth. It's a revelation of, of what's true, okay? I'm just giving you background, but the best part is coming. Number two, truth is constant. Truth does not change from the days of Jesus till today. It's absolute, not relative. For the Lord is good, and his truth endures how long? All generations. What is true is always true, eternally. Who never changes? Next slide. Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and? Hallelujah. You know it. Number three. Truth always, what? Wins. We cannot do anything against the truth, but only for the truth. Every lie will fall. Every lie will be exposed. All corruption, Jesus said, what is done in secret shall be revealed. It will fail. Do you know right now, God is Opening the corruption of different governors, different peoples, and we're going to see much more revelation of corruption. Now, we spoke about yesterday. We're speaking about today. What will happen tomorrow? This is the most interesting part of the message this morning. Society will not become better. I have bad news for you. Not the church, not Christians, but the governments and the society will become more corrupt, more evil. And the spirit of Antichrist will be given more permission. Do you know the devil can't do anything without the permission of God? And Jesus said that he who restrains through Apostle Paul, he said he will be taken out of the way. And because of lawlessness, the love of many will grow cold. Now, here's an interesting thing. Daniel is speaking of the time of the spirit of Antichrist. And speaking of the Antichrist himself, laws will be changed. You're going to see more laws against the Christian, against morality. He will speak, he, the Antichrist, will speak words against the Most High, blasphemy. He shall wear out the saints of God. To wear out means to constantly attack them until they're exhausted. This persecution will be constant and unrelenting. And listen to this phrase that Daniel prophesies. And the Antichrist will change the times and the law. Do you know what we've always been used to will change for the worse, not for the better. And then truth itself will not be honored or respected. Who cares if it's not true? We'll make it a law. Who cares if it's not morality? This is our government. This is what we say. This is our propaganda. You will believe what we say is true. He, the Antichrist, will throw truth to the ground and he will act. And this is the part I don't like. God allows the Antichrist to prosper. To prosper means to grow strong. To prosper means to have effect. It means to have power. Why would God allow this? Ah, oh, God is so wise. We'll tell you in a moment. The Antichrist will push propaganda. You know that. I remember in the Soviet Union, I went in 1973. There's no Pepsi-Cola, Coca-Cola signs, right? There was all lozunge, slogans. Proletariat всех стран соединяйтесь, right? And по-украински воно було Голодранці цілого світу гоп до купи. Not translatable. <laughs> the truth and the church 
shall be, shall be persecuted. Listen to what God revealed to John in heaven in Revelation chapter 13 verse 7. The Antichrist is given a name called the beast. Paruski zvier. That shows his nature. It will be savage. It will be like a wild lion or a wild bear in the woods. It will be a, a, a nature that has no mercy. A nature that destroys, will tear apart. Now watch this. The beast, the Antichrist, he will be allowed, by whom? By God, to make war on the saints. And to conquer them? Now wait a minute, wait a minute. Didn't Jesus say, all authority in heaven and earth is given to me? And in my name, I will give you power over the enemy and you shall tread upon serpents and you shall cast out demons? Amen. And that will always be true, even in this time. But there's one thing God did not give us power over. And you know what that one thing is? It's called persecution. There is no prayer to pray against persecution. There is no demon to cast out for persecution. You know why? Because people will persecute you. Demon-possessed people, yes. But you can't cast out a person. You can only cast out a demon. And when the government, by people, turns to support the beast, the Antichrist, they will be allowed to declare war against the church of Jesus Christ, against the churches, against the Bible, against Christians, and to conquer them. You know, I prayed about this. I said, Lord, I don't understand. How is it that you're giving authority in that time for the Antichrist to conquer a Christian? Then it was revealed to me, only the body. On Friday, the demons of hell used the Jewish people to tell the Roman soldiers to crucify the Son of God, and that day they won. Yes? They conquered Jesus. <laughs> Their physical power made his physical body to die. They killed him until Sunday morning. <laughs> Do you know the final victory will be ours? And five chapters later, John explains how this conquering by the Antichrist actually is flipped and how it is redeemed. They overcame the Antichrist. How? Three ways. Number one, by the blood of the Lamb. Did you know the blood of Jesus has power? Hallelujah. And when you are washed in the blood of Jesus, you're ready to die. Yes, amen? What can they threaten you with if you're ready to die? The blood of Jesus has power. Number two, they overcame him by the word of their testimony. Do you know that Jesus said you will give an opportunity to say why you're against the laws of the Antichrist? Why? You're against their persecution. Speak in that moment. And the Holy Spirit will give you the words to say. Hallelujah. And number three, they overcame them because they did not love their lives even unto death. Jesus died for you and for me. Possibly, if we're still alive, would you be willing to die for Jesus? Or will you give in to the Antichrist? Now I know that people say, oh, we won't be on the earth. We'll be raptured. That's a possibility. But if not, and we go through the seven years, wow, what then? Tomorrow, the next slide, our word of forgiveness, that's the one, that's the one, has power. And the Holy Spirit is revealed through a faithful witness. And Jesus said, the gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations. And then the end shall come. You see, the gospel will be preached in good times. 
the gospel will be preached in bad times. The gospel will be preached in persecution. And when we are persecuted, our faith is purified. So now, here's the conclusion. Remember the past. That's our history. Work in the present. Do you know what Billy Graham said? And I, and, I, and I don't know if it was original with him, but I, you know, he, he was a voice to my generation. He said, well, Jesus is coming. What do we do? How do we work? He said these words. He said, live like Jesus is coming tomorrow. Work like Jesus is coming in 100 years. I thought that was good. Live your life like Jesus is coming tomorrow. But work for the Lord, for the kingdom, for the church, for the body of Christ. Like Jesus has given you one more hundred years and prepare for the future. Jesus said, when these things begin to come to pass, look up, lift your heads. Don't, don't look at your feet. Don't look at the earth. Don't look at your pity. Don't look at your sorrow. Don't look at your persecution. Don't look at the corrupt government. Don't look at people who are not loving God. Look up. Because Jesus will break the eastern sky with millions of angels. Millions of millions of angels. And we'll be caught up with Jesus. Our redemption is coming nigh. And behold, I come quickly. Hallelujah. Let's stand and have a prayer, and then I'll take questions. Maybe you have questions. Hallelujah. 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 Glory to your name. Come, Jesus. Come quickly, Lord. Come soon. Come for your church, Lord. Redeem us, Lord, from the evil. Give us grace. Give us power. Give us, Lord Jesus, the power of the Holy Spirit to live a life, Lord, that is ready to say, I am a believer of Christ. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Come, Lord Jesus. Come in power. Come in glory. But before you come, Lord, use us to glorify your name on the earth, Lord, to preach the gospel, to stand up for the truth. Lord. We give you glory. We give you honor. We give you praise. Hallelujah. 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 Thank you, Jesus. Pre prepare your church, Lord. Prepare us for that time, Lord. Make us strong in our faith, Lord. For you are the resurrection. And you are the life. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, hallelujah. Precious Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Work in our heart. Prepare us, Lord. Prepare us, Lord. And if you come quickly, Lord, take us with you. But prepare us should we have to stay. Jesus name and all God's people said amen amen